two Italian men, two great friends, one called Antonio, the other Bassanio. Let's explore their relationship in Shakespeare's wonderful The Merchant of Venice. Stay tuned, you're watching Schofield on Shakespeare. From the very beginning of the play, it is clear that Antonio and Bassanio share a very close bond, one that is recognised and respected by others. In Act 1, Scene 1, the pair are left to talk to each other on a one-to-one -one basis, with another friend, Lorenzo, parting soon after these words. My Lord Bassanio, since you have found Antonio, we too will leave you. And indeed, it quickly becomes apparent that the two men are used to confiding secrets in each other when alone together. Antonio, keen to be a part of every aspect of his friend's life and soul, asks, Well, tell me now what lady is the same to whom you swore a secret pilgrimage that you today promised to tell me of? There is an eager, gossipy impatience in these words, as seen in the insistent imperative, tell me, whilst a reference to Bassanio promising to tell him about it today implies that the story has been partially revealed beforehand. It is something that Antonio has been anticipating hearing about. So it is clear that the men trust each other implicitly with their inner thoughts and hopes. They tell each other details that they would not share with anyone else. However, the same scene makes it clear that the friendship is not an equal one. Bassanio has been and continues to be indebted to Antonio for his financial assistance. For the benefit of the audience, he reveals why. I have disabled my estate by something showing a more swelling port than my fate means would grant continuance. In other words, he has damaged his own financial position by being more extravagant, showing a more swelling port that his own comparatively insubstantial wealth can support. Now, for many of us, a friend persistently living beyond their means and relying on us to support them would quickly become mightily irritating. Not so with Antonio, who seems extraordinarily devoted to Bassanio, as implied in profligate proclamations including, my purse, my person, my extremist means lie all unlocked to your occasions. So Antonio is prepared to offer apparently unlimited financial support, his own person, and indeed anything he can do whatsoever to help out his friend. The reference to my person foreshadows his agreement to the sinister, cannibalistic terms of Shylock's 3,000 ducats loan, but could also imply a degree of sexual desire. Should Bassanio feel the urge, he would be most willing to unlock his body in order to cater for the carnal needs of his young friends. To give Bassanio credit, he clearly feels some awkwardness about the inequality of their financial positions. This is shown in the cryptic imagery he uses to request yet more dosh from his puppy-eyed friends. He rambles, if you please to shoot another arrow that self way which you did shoot the first, I do not doubt as I will watch the aim to find both or bring your latter hazard back again and thankfully rest debtor for the first. The references to shooting arrows are Bassanio's roundabout references to cash injections and here he is claiming that if Antonio lends him more money on this occasion it will result in him being able to pay all his money back. The imagery of arrows and shooting allows Bassanio to ask for something as coarse as cash in a veiled poetic way but there are other possible connotations too. The most famous archer of all is surely Cupid, the god of love and desire, whilst the repetition of shoot may allow the so inclined actor to ham up homoerotic undertones, for example with a naughty thrusting movement or cheeky wink. 
Michael Radford's star-studded 2004 film version of the play chooses to play with this idea of underlying homoerotic desire between the two men. Or certainly, Bassanio using Antonio's possible desire for him to his advantage. Following Antonio's command for Bassanio to seek out credit in his name in Venice, the latter gives him a full-blooded kiss in grateful appreciation. Try what my credit can in Venice do. It shall be racked even to the uttermost to furnish you to Belmont and Fair Portia. Of course, there is no reason why mere friends shouldn't express their gratitude and respect for each other by kissing on the lips, but it is fairly unusual. There is something gloriously poignant and ironic about Bassanio kissing Antonio on the lips after the latter has agreed to help provide finance for him to travel to Belmont to fair Portia, which if all goes to plan will result in a heterosexual relationship which will inevitably diminish their own friendship relationship. But Antonio is very much a figure of self-sacrifice and this is something I will explore further later in this video. And so the opening scene indicates that Antonio and Bassanio's friendship is considered to be closer than that of any of the other men. The Bassanio has been dependent on Antonio for financial support, partly due to his own extravagance, and that Antonio seems extraordinarily devoted to his friends. Indeed, he is hurt by the caged, cautious manner in which Bassanio asks him for further cash. He rebukes him. Out of doubt, you do me now more wrong in making question of my uttermost than if you had made waste of all I have. So, even if Bassanio had shamelessly disposed of everything Antonio had, all his money and worldly belongings, it would be wrong of him to doubt his willingness to find a way to support him further. Act 1, Scene 3 provides further insight into the extent to which Antonio is willing to support his friends. He is both prepared to temporarily disregard strongly held principles and put himself in a perilous position with a man he detests. As a Christian, he believes that gaining a profit from lending money to others is a sin, and this is bitterly, indirectly confirmed by Shylock, a Jewish moneylender. He lends out money gratis and brings down the rate of usance here with us in Venice. The adjective gratis in this context means interest-free, and the willingness of someone to lend money free of charge is, of course, going to have a detrimental effect on the potential interest that can be charged by others. Yet Antonio, who has no ready cash as all his fortunes are at sea, agrees to borrow money from Shylock to support Bassanio, even though he detests the former and abhors the means by which he makes a living. In an extraordinary vault face, Antonio says, Shylock, albeit I never lend nor borrow by taking nor by giving of excess, yet to supply the right wants of my friends, I'll break a custom. It is important to look more closely at the context here. Antonio doesn't just disagree with the notion of money lending, he publicly preaches to others about it. Shylock reveals that Antonio hates our sacred nation and he rails even there where merchants most do congregate on me, my bargains and my well-won thrift, which he calls interest. Venice at the end of the 16th century would have been a thriving hub of mercantile activity. According to Shylock, Antonio positions himself in the busiest spot to fiercely and evangelically condemn the practice of lending out money at a profit. Yet here he is, downplaying his passionate beliefs as mere custom, something that he can break, and for a man who freely admits to an overly lavish past. So whilst Antonio's decision to do business with Shylock has more than a whiff of hypocrisy about it, it also illustrates the spell-like hold Bassanio has over him. He loves his friends and must continue to show his devotion at all costs, whatever the cost to himself, his reputation and his principles. And the details of the deal give a further clue to the pair's intimacy. Shylock, apparently as a merry sport, proposes that if the 3,000 ducats needed to fund Bassanio's jaunt to woo Portia and Belmont are not paid on time, 
The forfeit should be an equal pound of your fair flesh to be cut off and taken in what part of your body pleaseth me. This is a quite extraordinary proposition and both the audience and Antonio know enough about Shylock to realise that it cannot be dismissed as mere merry sports. Bassanio is horrified and tries to call the deal off there and then. Yet Antonio elects to put on a front of manly insouciance and conjures up some mathematical guesstimates to show his own virile confidence about being able to return the money in time. He swaggers. Why fear not, man? I will not forfeit it. Within these two months, I do expect return of thrice three times the value of this bond. Note the imperative, fear not. The casual use of man and the dazzling multiples of three all intended to consolidate Antonio's position as the man who will always, always support his dear friend Bassanio, however apparently difficult the circumstances. Indeed, is there something masochistic in Antonio's readiness to agree to such a grisly bond? Has he interpreted Shylock's reference to fair flesh as an opportunity to reinforce his own manliness? Think of Samson's boast of being a pretty piece of flesh in relation to Montague maids at the beginning of Romeo and Juliet. Looking at other relationships within the play is also helpful when it comes to understanding the bonds between Antonio and Bassanio. For example, note how Bassanio speaks to Graziano, another friend, in Act 2, Scene 2. He says bluntly, Thou art too wild, too rude and bold of voice. Pray thee take pains to allay with some cold drops of modesty thy skipping spirit. Bassanio's frank description of less savoury aspects of Graziano's character reinforces by comparison the close harmony that exists between himself and Antonio. There is no need for candid character descriptions and warnings about how to behave within their relationship. It is also interesting to look at the structure set up that will supposedly enable Portia to find love within a heterosexual relationship. Her father has decreed that Portia's suitor must interpret a series of riddles attached to gold, silver and leaden boxes and choose correctly in order to win her hand in marriage. Whilst the riddles unquestionably conjure up some useful morals about the importance of substance over superficiality, the fact remains that a relationship will be triggered via an elaborate guessing game. In comparison, Antonio and Bassanio's friendship with the former's quiet, selfless devotion, as seen in his command for Bassanio not to slubber business for my sake and for the Jews' bond which he have of me, let it not enter in your mind of love, seems remarkably pure and substantial. Predictably enough, Antonio finds that he is not able to pay back Shylock's loan in time and the latter insists upon the forfeiture of his enemy's pound of flesh. In Act 3, Scene 2, Antonio writes to Bassanio, now celebrating his correct selection of the leaden box and hence looking forward to the prospect of marrying Portia with the grisly news. Bassanio is devastated and describes the effect of the letter on him. Here is a letter, lady, the paper as the body of my friend and every word in it a gaping wound issuing life blood. Bassanio's imagery indicates that he is all too aware of Antonio's potential fate to die by having a piece of flesh cut from his body and that he himself feels torturous pain caused by his own metaphorical gaping wounds with every word he reads from the letter. Such imagery suggests a genuine synergy between the two men. They are able to physically empathise with each other's situations and indeed when Bassanio returns to Venice to see his helpless friends, he furiously roars a desperate request to take his place. The Jew shall have my flesh, blood, bones and all, ere thou shalt lose for me one drop of blood. But what I find particularly interesting is Antonio's reaction to his probable death. Following unsuccessful pleas with a grimly determined Shylock, Antonio seems to resign himself to his fate with just a single, simple request to be satisfied. He tells Solano and the jailer, Well, jailer, on, 
pray Bassanio come to see me pay his debts, and then I care not. So as long as Bassanio sees him die, and therefore by extension understands the extent to which he loved him, Antonio will part this world with a degree of fatalistic acceptance. This emphasises the extraordinary, central, exclusive role Bassanio plays in Antonio's life. There doesn't appear to be anyone else whom he cares about. Isn't there something particularly unhealthy about a single-minded fixation when it is not fully reciprocated? Whereas Bassanio has moved on to the excitement of new, heterosexual love, Antonio, awaiting a grisly death, stagnates with staid thoughts of devotion based on the past. And so Bassanio returns to witness what he knows may be Antonio's last few moments. However, unbeknown to him, his wife Portia has returned with him, disguised as the young legal whiz Balthazar. Antonio gives an understandably melodramatic speech to his friends, which paints a decidedly romantic tint to his final proceedings. He cries out, Commend me to your honourable wife, tell her the process of Antonio's end, say how I loved you, speak me fair in death, and when the tale is told, bid her be judge, whether Bassanio had not once a love. The use of third person in Antonio's end and Bassanio, as opposed to my end and you, creates a distance between Antonio and his words. It is as though he is narrating a great romantic tale from the greatest bowels of history, as opposed to talking about his own world and feelings. Someone looking at these words out of context, perhaps reading Antonia for Antonio, would automatically assume they referred to a tragic, heterosexual love story. But of course, they are not, and are referring to a friendship in which one man made the decision to fund the other ad nauseam, irrespective of the wisdom of doing so. Faced with such emotional, quasi-heroic words from a friend whom he thinks is about to die, Bassanio responds in kind and declares, but life itself, my wife and all the world are not with me esteemed about their, about their life. I would lose all, I and sacrifice them all, here to this devil to deliver you. Due to the dramatic irony of Portia's disguised presence, these words become more than a mere heat of the moment, emotional proclamation. They pose threatening questions about society's hierarchies, which traditionally position heterosexual marriage well above male friendship. Although Portia has shown her absolute support for Bassanio's friend through financial means and postponing the consummation of their marriage, her implicit assumption is that their relationship will become the most important in both of their lives. Hence, she is displeased to hear that, theoretically, she would be sacrificed to a ruthless Jewish moneylender to save her husband's best friend. She states archly, Your wife would give you little thanks for that if she were by to hear you make the offer. And it is Portia's hidden presence in Act 4, Scene 1, which allows her paradoxically to both preserve Antonio and Bassanio's friendship by manipulating legal argument to save the life of the former and ensure her own relationship with Bassanio will be given absolute precedent in the future. Before Bassanio left Belmont in Act 3, Scene 2, Portia gave him a ring to safeguard with these stern words of warning. When you part from this ring, lose or give away, let it presage the ruin of your love and be my vantage to exclaim on you. Disguised as Balthazar and flush with the success of twisting Shylock's bond against him to his ruin, Portia decides to test Bassanio by asking for his ring as a gift of gratitude. He initially refuses until Antonio persuades him to cede and hand it over. With Portia having already exited, having failed to obtain the ring, Antonio says this to Bassanio. My Lord Bassanio, let him have the ring. Let his deservings and my love withal be valued against your wife's commandments. Antonio follows his instructions without demur, and in doing so, symbolically places his financial and moral debt to Bassanio above his relationship with his wife. However, of course, all Bassanio has done is effectively return his ring to his wife. But in doing so, he's given her a trump card to play, which will allow her to shift the spotlight away from Antonio to herself. Back in Belmont in Act 5, Scene 1, 
Rather than spending too much time celebrating Antonio's escape, Portia toys with Bassanio about the ring and exclaims, By heaven, I will ne'er come in your bed until I see the ring. This is a clever shift from Portia, as it shifts Bassanio's consciousness from thinking about Antonio's saved pound of flesh to the desirability of her own physical body. It also acts as a not so subtle reminder of what her relationship with Bassanio can provide. Glorious, heart-pumping, heterosexual sex, which the Antonio Bassanio axis cannot. Of course, the audience know that Portia herself has the ring, and so we enjoy the comedy of Bassanio trying to twist his way out of a situation which loyalty to Antonio has created. The situation is only resolved when Portia decides Bassanio has squirmed enough and symbolically returns the ring to her husband via Antonio. Antonio hands the ring to his friend and commands him swear to keep this ring, which effectively means swear to be loyal forever to your wife and to value your relationship with her above all others, including mine own goddammit. So to sum up, how does Shakespeare present the relationship between Antonio and Bassanio in The Merchant of Venice? At the beginning of the play, the two are incredibly close, albeit with one reliant on the other for financial support and the other prepared to do literally anything to continue supporting him. Antonio's decision to do business with Shylock illustrates his extraordinary devotion to his friend, whilst also making him seem a little hip um, hypocritical. When it seems as though Antonio is going to die, Bassanio responds to his friend's emotive, tragic, hero-esque yarn with a doubtless exceedingly welcome suggestion that he too loves him above all else, including possibly his new wife. However, the same new wife is present to subtly manipulate matters, and the play ends with the unspoken assumption that the antonio Bassanio friendship will never reach the dizzy heights attained in earlier scenes of the play, and will gradually become a forum for occasional nostalgia, as opposed to daily devotion. Isn't Antonio almost Don Pedro-esque in his diminished importance at the end of the play? In Much Ado About Nothing, Don Pedro is a central figure in the beginning and middle of the play, both encouraging Claudio and Benedict in their lovemaking and ultimately fending off the dastardly plans of his wicked bastard brother. But at the end, Benedict has taken on this central role and in the closing lines to the play, jauntily rebukes his old friend, who does not reply. Prince, thou art sad, get thee a wife, get thee a wife. There is no staff more reverent than one tipped with horn. In Branagh's film production of the play, Don Pedro's isolation from the happy, fulfilled heterosexuality of the others is highlighted in his absence from the final exuberant dance. In this production, he is played by Denzel Washington. Strike up, Pipers! Meanwhile, in The Merchant of Venice, the play ends with Bassanio looking forward to lying with my wife and Graziano vowing to fear no other thing so sore as keeping safe Nerissa's ring. Radford's production shows Antonio having been left on his own, with his male friends about to otherwise occupy themselves with their new wives. Keeping safe Nerissa's ring. <laughs> But I guess that's the circle of life, eh? Friendship strongly valued in our youths, but for the majority of us, these will inevitably and inexorably be superseded by romantic relationships and marriage. These may or may not produce children who themselves would value their friendship strongly in their youths. Some people get left behind. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production exploring the relationship between Antonio and Bassanio in The Merchant of Venice. Many thanks for watching.